We're moving through the book of Acts, Acts of Faith and Proclamation, and here in chapter 16, the focus seems to be on freedom. And, and there are those in our society who, who perceive to live free lives, but really, really, their lives are in bondage. And then there are those who, whose lives look, look imprisoned, and they evoke sympathy on our hearts, and yet they're the ones that are set free. They're the ones that are at peace. There are those who are, who are single, and uh, people say, uh, you're, you're free to do whatever you want. You're free to go where you want, do what you want, be what you want. You are accountable to no one, and yet in their heart of hearts, they're aching because they would love nothing more than to be in a, a deep relationship with someone else, to have a, a committed friendship with another. There are young mothers who, who are blessed with children, and, and people see them as blessed, and they're freed, and yet, and yet the mother is exhausted, not being able to get a rhythm of sleep, constantly giving, constantly looking after, constantly caring for another, that she becomes empty, and she finds herself trapped. She finds herself in a rut, and, and wondering, wondering, how long will this take? There are couples who, who live in marriages, where one may feel locked, one may feel imprisoned, unfed, in a, in a relationship that, that's designed to let us go and to be free. Some of us have jobs that have such a grip on our whole being that we find ourselves driven to succeed and everybody perceives us as being going here, going there, being successful in everything we do, and yet we find ourselves imprisoned. We can't get out of, it's not satisfying the soul that we've, the, the, the soul that the Lord has given us to, to, to work, to serve. And so there are many who, who perceive to be freed and yet they're imprisoned. Paul and Silas came to Philippi, and, and they wanted to look for a, a gathering of prayer, and they were followed by a, a young woman who had a spirit in her that gave her the ability to predict the future. And there were some owners who, who made sure that, that others would pay, and they would, receive, and they would receive money from her divination. And of all things, she would cry out. She would follow Paul and Silas and say, this woman, this woman, uh, he, he would, this, this woman would say, these men follow the li high, living high God, and they are pointing you to the direction to be saved. Well, that must have struck them odd the first time they heard that. This, this young woman is perceptive. But she continued on and it happened day after day in a loud voice. These men are following the high, living high God and they will point you to the direction to be saved. It so annoyed Paul that he turned around and said, this can't be from this girl's heart herself. In the name of Jesus, I command that you come out. And the Spirit left her. Amazing. Even evil spirits recognize the name of Jesus and the authority that he has over all heaven and earth. Well, of course, this got Paul and Silas into all kinds of trouble because the owners of this girl took them to the magistrates and said, they're causing all kinds of havoc in our community. They're Jews, and you know how Jews are, and, and they're, they're pushing their religious beliefs on us against that which Rome believes. And the magistrates had them whipped and flogged stripped, whipped, and flogged, and thrown into prison. Freedom is not always what it's called to be. For there are those who, whose lives perceive to be free, and yet they live in bondage. And then the story continues. There are those whose lives 
look to be imprisoned, look to be in bondage, look to be in a rut, and yet they are set free. We saw that last week. It's uh, good to see Clem here this morning. Man, I'll tell you, we had such a good weekend last weekend. Um, uh, met with Jody's parents, and, and Jody's parents never thought that, that Jody would get married. And I learned that Clem, for the longest time, prayed, and he prayed, Lord, all I want is a girlfriend. Well, a lot more happened than that. And last week, we had a wonderful celebration, a wonderful celebration of the marriage of Clem Besmer and Jody Nichols. And for those of you who weren't there, I'm going to give you an opportunity to applaud that occasion. That's a great big occasion. You, you, the two of you really, really blessed us in that, Clem, and uh, we are just excited for both you and Jody. And the peace that the two of you have found and, and that you have, it happened uh, also on Tuesday at... Uh, at uh, Femi Wickering's um, funeral, the testimonies that we received, how, um, how Dick and Femi would together uh, for, for years each have their own Bible and do devotions, and their kids, in spite of all of Femi's difficulties and struggles and, and physical ailments, uh, there was a faith that seemed to uh, exude in and amidst the struggles. One of the grandchildren said, uh, even said that, that Grandma has even shown us how to die well. In the midst of a life that, that felt so, um, so, so struggle-filled and, and pain-filled, uh, there, was, there was peace and there was joy. After the service, I, I got to talk again with Bob Hammersma. Uh, some of you know him from Beansville Church, and, and Bob is a, a quadriplegic, and had a wonderful conversation with him. And here's a man who, who is trapped inside of his own body, and yet when you talk with him, when you speak with him, you cannot help but hear how peace-filled his heart is how in tune he is with, with what the Holy Spirit is doing in the lives of those around him. There's something that's so strong in each of our hearts. Peter Skipper, when he comes into church, he's got a huge smile on his face. He just loves being here. He loves being here together, worshiping with us. There's a peace with Peter that takes place in the midst of in, in the midst of his journey through MS. So here's Paul and Silas, and you've got to believe that they were shocked. And they've been whipped, they've been stripped, and they've been flogged. They are hurting. And the story tells us it was around midnight when Paul and Silas, and, and I don't know what happened, I don't know what took place, because, because they were bruised, they were wounded, because they didn't know how quickly they found themselves in prison. But Paul begins singing. He starts humming a tune. And it's a tune that Silas knows, and, and suddenly the two of them are singing in this dark, cavernous space. They're singing to their Lord. And it says that they also prayed, and it made me wonder what they prayed. It made me wonder, what kind of prayer did Paul and Silas lift up to the Lord? Were they, were they offering God praise in the midst of this darkest moment? How is it that people who were confronted in, in the most uh, difficult circumstances in life find that in those moments they experience this peace that passes all understanding? And that's a gift that, that some of you have been able to taste, that some of you have witnessed God's presence in our midst. What is freedom? What is freedom as, as we know it, and what is freedom as the world tries to sell it to us? There have been people who have looked to be imprisoned and yet found themselves with this peace that passes all understanding. And then Luke continues the story of what took place. Suddenly there's this earthquake that shakes the entire prison. And it must have shaken Paul and Silas too. But in that shaking, all the doors were shaken off their hinges and the chains 
that they were latched onto. Somehow these chains had a way of, of breaking off. Their feet were put in stocks and the stocks popped up and everything shook around them. And then we're told all of those who were imprisoned were set free. Imagine the dust that that must have caused. Imagine the fear of wondering if the ceilings would, would, would hold. And then there's the jailer. And there's clanking and, and there's, there's, there's darkness. And, and uh, Paul must have connected his heart to the jailer's. As the jailer saw that the doors were open, he was ready to fall on his own sword. And Paul yells out, don't harm yourself. We're all here. And what does the jailer do? The jailer runs to Paul and Silas. Could he have heard their singing? Could he have heard? He was asleep. He woke up. He was filled with fear. The prisoners, are they going to come out and kill me as a jailer? Am I going to be killed by my bosses for not having kept these people in prison? Filled with fear, he was ready to follow his own sword. And what does he do? He comes running to Paul and Silas, and he asks this question. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? What an interesting question. Why would he ask such a question? Acts 16, verse 25. Out of all the things that he's thinking of, he may be fearing for his own life. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And he could have well been thinking of his own life. He could have well been thinking that they were going to turn on him. He was looking for, he was looking for help. And Paul and Silas say, well, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now, we've been journeying through the book of Acts, and, and we've heard other things. You mean you don't have to follow Moses and all his laws? You mean you don't have to go to Jerusalem and worship in the temple? You mean you don't have to be circumcised? And it came to this crisis that happened in the midst of the prison where the jailer was told, all you need to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. And then they went on to teach him, and they went to talk. And what does he do? He takes them to his place, and he washes their wounds, and he bandages them, and then he invites them to his place for a meal. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his household. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. There was something shattering that was taking place. There is power. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus against the evil spirits of this world, against the brokenness in which we live casting out demons, but also and especially in helping people receive the forgiveness of their sins so that people might experience this freedom that comes from knowing Jesus. The forgiveness of sins. It's one of those things that is so unique to the church of Jesus Christ offering to the community and the culture of which we are a part. It's a freedom that people have burdens and find themselves in bondage and imprisoned in their own lives, looking to be freed from. I'm going to come back to you, but there's one more piece in the story. When Paul and Silas see the transformation in the jailer and the family's household, they are emboldened in spirit. And Paul's boldness is, is, is he returns, 
And the magistrates that morning, they come back and say, Paul and Silas, you, you may be freed. And Paul says, hold it, hold it. You're going you're gonna to ask me to leave after what you've done to me? I mean, you didn't have a case for me. I didn't have a trial. And you had me publicly stripped and beaten and flogged. And then you threw me into prison. And me, a Roman citizen, you did all of that? And the magistrates did not know that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. And so what Paul is doing is Luke is reminding him that Paul is on a journey, and now he has something over the magistrates. If he would tell anyone else that this is what the magistrates did to Roman citizens, if he went on to Rome to let that be known, they might be thrown in prison. And so in that, there's a hint of where Paul is going. Paul is on his way to Rome because he wants to let the highest person in the land know that Jesus is Lord that this world belongs to him, that he has all authority in heaven and on earth. And so what does Paul do? He says, I want the magistrate themselves who made this happen to come and escort us out of the prison. What? That's it? Yeah, he wants to put it in their face a little bit, rub their noses in it a little bit. Let them see them face to face who Jesus is. And so the magistrates came and said, please, please, we're sorry. Please, you may leave. You may go. And where does Paul go? Paul finds the boldness to go back to Lydia's house where he meets with the believers. Who's Lydia? Lydia gave her life to the Lord. She was the woman, that, uh, the purple dye lady who they met at the river. And, the Lord, and Paul saw Jesus take a hold of her heart. They gathered together with the believers and they encouraged them. You've got to hear what happened. We couldn't believe in ourselves. It took place in prison where we were freed. There's an amazing story of God's power at work, and it's one that takes place in our lives as well. And so there are times in our lives when we too find ourselves boxed in. We find ourselves confined. We may even feel that our lives are imprisoned, and, and it feels like we've got these chains that are hanging on us. We could even find ourselves wrestling with evil spirits, with, with things in our lives, that, that uh, addictions that we just cannot let go of. Jesus, Jesus has the power to release you. Jesus is the key to loosening the chains of Satan's grip in each of our lives. He has that ability to free us from our sin, not only from the sins of our past, but the sins that we are caught in now. Secondly, what Jesus offers is his pardon. When we receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ, we enter a whole new relationship with him of forgiveness of having been set free. It allows us to normalize our relationships. It allows us to trust in God that he will be with us all, in our, all along the way. It gives us trust in the midst of our brokenness, knowing that God is with us, that Jesus loves us and that the Holy Spirit will continue to be with us. And third, he instills in our heart a boldness to connect with other believers, to search each other out. And we trust and pray that you are able to do that this summer. I really appreciated uh, the prayer that PJ was offering where at a time where we're able to meet new people, where we're able to have uh, suppers and celebrations with family members and friends. In September, we hope to have cluster groups. May you have the boldness to sign up and be a part of a cluster group, get to know a few other people for seven weeks. May you have the courage to reach out to those who are coming new or who do not yet know Jesus. As Paul is setting his heart for Rome, as he is continuing in the vision and the mission of Jesus Christ, may we sense God's Spirit working in our hearts as well. May we sense the acts of faith and proclamation being a continuation of what we read in chapters 1 through 28 in year 1 through 2018 in this church, in this region, in this province, in this nation, in this world that we are a part of as we continue to wait 
for Christ's return. And all God's people sing, amen. Lord, we want to thank you for the working of your Spirit. We want to thank you for the power that you hold even over Satan and evil spirits. We want to thank you for helping us see, perceive freedoms that actually have us in bondage. Holy Spirit, may you work in our lives, and may you give us eyes to see and ears to hear with people whose lives are imprisoned, and may you give us the words to say to help release them from their bondage. We thank you for the pardon that you give us in the forgiveness of our sins, for the peace that passes all understanding, even in the greatest moments of crisis, how we too know hymns from memory, songs and spiritual songs by heart, how we too have this relationship where we're able to talk to you, pray with you, and speak with you in all that we do. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for living in our midst. May you continue to grow in us a boldness to grow your kingdom, to share your love, to further your kingdom so that it may be on earth as it is in heaven.